Emma Eckstein's nose refused to heal. Operations in those days were done without antibiotics or modern anaesthetic techniques. Emma's condition remained bad and the bleeding started again. She nearly died a second time. Freud called in leading Viennese surgeons who performed a series of operations to save her life. mistake had been made, what we would call today malpractice. Fleece bungled the operation. He didn't know what he was doing. And this poor woman nearly died. Now Freud is faced with a choice. He can either write to Fleece and say, you know what really happened? You screwed up, Wilhelm. That's what happened. And you really ought not to be forming these operations or any other as far as I'm concerned. Leave people's noses alone. But he doesn't do that. He writes to Fleece and tells him, you're a great surgeon. I would put myself in your hands, my family in your hands. There's nobody like you. Dearest Wilhelm, of course, no one is blaming you, nor would I know why they should. It was a, a great thing that he covered Fleece. And uh, that he covered, I mean, he covered his friend and uh, so he was very, very upset about it. There was bleeding again, as if from the carotid artery. Another half a minute and she would have bled to death. She's doing better now. The packing was gently removed. There were no more mishaps. She is in the clear. As Emma at last got well, Freud thought hard about her bleeding. Could there have been some other reason why she had bled so much? Emma, we're told by Freud, was a bleeder and bled from early childhood on whenever she could because this seemed to give her the attention from her parents that perhaps she desired. And illness and bleeding became a way of actually uh, saying, here I am. She could not express her emotions verbally but that she expressed her emotions by body language, uh, thus uh, using, under quotations, uh, the blood as expression of uh, feelings with sexual connotations. But could she not have just bled because she was cut? Of course. Uh, the question is, sir, who is approaching the case? Uh, a surgeon or a psychoanalyst? I'm not a surgeon. I think what Freud learned through her, and we're now talking about Freud because we know more about him than we do about Emma, is that, that the dividing line that he was concerned about between the organic, I mean, whether her symptoms were to do with some kind of, of physical malaise, and the psychic, um, in, through Emma's case we see that they're very deeply intermingled and that the so-called physical intervention by Fleece into her nose um, ended up with a psychic relief. Eckstein remembers the devil sticking needles into her fingers and then placing a sweet on each drop of blood. If you thought of her as a patient coming now, here is someone that's having terrible troubles in her life with anything to do with blood. Um, he said that she gave another account of having had a bit of her vagina mutilated and that she was made to eat the skin and drink the blood. Now this is something that has only happened to a very small number of people in reality it's happened to more people in fantasy but I actually think there's a very serious possibility that it had really happened to Emma. 
What's so interesting from today's point of view is Emma Eckstein was almost certainly the first woman to talk to Freud about sexual abuse in childhood. And he listened to her and he believed her. Dear Wilhelm, first of all, Eckstein. I shall be able to prove to you that you were right, that her episodes of bleeding were hysterical and were caused by longing and probably took place at the sexually relevant times predicted by your theory. She was deformed, her face was deformed. We know that she was confined to a couch, that she died early, that she never had much of a life afterward, and that this was all connected with this operation, and that Freud found her very difficult. However, we also know that she continued to revere both Freud and Fleece, which is amazing when you think of it. That she would have continued to respect Fleece, I find astounding. I don't understand it. In late July 1895, Freud and his wife went to stay for the weekend at the Bellevue, a hotel just outside Vienna. Before he left home, he wrote a letter to Fleece. Demon, why don't you write? How are you? Don't you care any more about what I'm doing? What is happening to the nose, to menstruation, to your wife, and to the budding little one? And that night, Freud dreamed the most important dream of his life. A dream that appeared to be about a patient he'd been thinking about the previous day, a woman called Irma. The dream, 24th of July, 1895, just before his wife's birthday. Uh, his wife is pregnant. He's recovering from the disaster with Emma, who is now, it seems, you know, out of the convalescent home. Um, and the dream happens. A large hall, numerous guests whom we were receiving. Among them was Irma. You still get pains, it's really only your fault. If you only knew what pains I've got now in my throat and stomach and abdomen, it's choking me. I saw a white patch and terminal bones with scabs on them. She has a dull area down on the left. There's no doubt it's an infection, but no matter. Dysentery will supervene and the toxin will be eliminated. Not long before, when she was feeling unwell, my friend Otto had given her an injection of a preparation of propyls, propionic acid and trimethylamine. Injections of that sort should not be made so thoughtlessly. Probably the syringe was not clean. According to Freud, it was the beginning of psychoanalysis. 
uh, if he said this, uh, he wondered, he wrote to Fleas whether, whether anyone will recognize that here I discovered the interpretation of dreams. There is this absolutely marvellous quotation um, that was in a letter that Freud wrote to Fleece in 1900. He was describing going back to Bellevue, the house where he actually had the dream about Irma, and he wrote, Do you suppose that some day a marble tablet will be placed on the house inscribed with these words, in this house, on July the 24th, 1895, the secret of dreams was revealed to Dr. Sigmund Freud. The secret of dreams is that there is a wish that's being fulfilled in the dream. And Freud worked out that this could be on all sorts of levels, not just at the easiest initial level of decoding a dream, but at all sorts of unconscious levels. And what was his wish in this particular dream? Well, one major wish was that, um, I think, that something awful hadn't happened to Emma Eckstein, that it wasn't his fault, that he had been a good clinician, that he hadn't caused any harm to anybody. One is struck by how closely parts of the dream follow the kind of examination that Fleece, who was a surgeon, which Freud was not, would have conducted of Emma. So that you might say the Emma sections of the dream, or the, the sense in which Emma is part of the dream, is Fleece at work. And one of the main themes of the dream is Freud is saying, I'm not responsible for bad things that happen to my patients, and nor is Fleece responsible. But the other side of the dream is saying, well, perhaps Fleece is responsible. Perhaps he's a, a naughty doctor. Perhaps he's not up to it. Perhaps he doesn't know his, uh, his trade well enough. He had created a situation in which somebody's life was in danger. He really had, that Emma Eckstein nearly died and that ultimately he, Freud, was responsible. He had sent her to Fleece. So I don't think there's any way that he could simply slough that off or get it out of his mind or simply say, oh, I'm not going to think about that anymore. I'm not going to remember it. I choose not to remember that. I think that this haunted Freud's conscience. What are the classical interpretations of this dream? Well, um, the general uh, meaning or symbolizing of an injection is a penis, or at least a penis in action. Um, an organ which is um, penetrating, like the needle from the searing is penetrating. When uh, one of Freud's followers, Karl Abraham, said, this dream is all about dirt and sex and syphilis. Freud said, I'm afraid not. It's about my sexual megalomania. I have all three women in the dream. And Freud was talking about his daughter's godmothers, Anna Hammerschlag-Lichtheim, who is Irma in the dream, Sophie Schwab Panet, who is uh, a friend of the families and a friend of Ir Irma's as well, Anna, and the third is Matilda Breuer. A portion of the skin in her left shoulder was infiltrated. I saw at once that this was the rheumatism in my own shoulder, which I get when I sit up late into the night. Freud identified with his patients, and one might say that's a crucial element of the whole practice he discovered. It embarrassed me having invented such a severe illness for Irma simply in order to clear myself. It looked so cruel. The dream of Irma's injection gave Freud the key to analyze himself. Now the dream is structured around Freud seeing a patient uh, of in investigating her throat of consultants coming in, of doctors making a fool of themselves, making fools of themselves. And Freud then seeing at the end of the dream uh, the 
formula, chemical formula, for trimethylamine, which, interestingly enough, is a decomposition product of sperm when it hits the atmosphere. This is the formula of trimethylamine, and we see nitrogen, three carbon atoms, the methyl groups, and the hydrogen. That is what Freud sees at the end of the dream. His father's three wives, 